Hello and welcome to the Fireside Fairy Tales. My name is Rory and you're watching Varietal Literature's YouTube page, which is a little cozy corner of the internet for narrative. And what we're doing here in the middle of October, one more week till Halloween exactly, which is something I will talk about at the end of the stream, if I remember. Um, then uh, <clears throat> what we're doing is sort of spooky tales Although some are more spooky than others, and tonight's are more fun and interesting. Well, actually, that's not true. Some, well, short, genuinely creep me out. So we'll see about, we'll see about you. Um, Genera uh, says, love the ambience music, and uh, Gia says, my favorite intro music. Oh, really? The other music that's really popular also from this time of year is the intro music to the Varietal Show. Uh, during Halloween <clears throat> the um, uh, I'm gonna say briefly what we're going to be doing tonight there's a, a fair bit to get through but we are gonna read five short stories about I guess what you would call cryptids or or sort of monsters of a legendary status uh, some are more cryptids than others uh, you could also view this as kind of a collection of short accounts of strange goings on from old folklore that don't necessarily fit one solid theme. Um, <clears throat> and uh, But they're ones that I wanted to tell before the month was out. So uh, that, that's sort of my motivation on this end. But we're going to see... Um, I guess, sorry, I'm a little out of sorts here. If you are not watching this live, down in the description below, there will be timestamps that can take you to whichever one interests you the most. And the ones that may interest you. The first one, well short, reminds me quite a bit of the internet's first piece of genuine folklore called The Slender Man. Um, and we're going to look at that. That's called The Long Man in the Murdia, Murder Alley at H Hulf. Um, <clears throat> we're going to read that one. That's our first one's very short. Then we're going to read one that has flavors of the ring to it. If you remember that horror film from a disturbing amount of years ago, that feels like a few years ago to me. Um, uh, whichever version you saw, American or Japanese. Um, and then we're going to see one about a supernatural stalker. Uh, and uh, then we're going to read two, well, sort of more than two, but two really titled collections of m monstrous bunnies uh to wrap it up <clears throat> uh these are in other words an assortment of tales about strange creatures that don't really fit a theme and aren't exactly in in long form story um but they are uh collected accounts where they are uh, about unexplained and wholly unique beasts i don't see discussed anywhere else along the lines of other cryptids like werewolves and Yeti and Loch Ness. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I don't have that much to say on it tonight. It's not a it's not a deep night. But I will tell you what I think I'm going to do for Halloween after the stories. I see Janera and Shana Towers are here. Thank you so much for watching and uh, coming back. If you are watching live, you can join in the live chat. If, uh, there's always good discussion about the weird things I read in there if you want to join in on it. Well, I'm going to have a little drink of water and then I'm going to uh, pick some some alley uh, content and then we're going to get to a series of short tales and accounts of strange cryptids and folklore. <clears throat> do a little bit of wind here our first story tonight is a short but in my opinion one of the most impactfully disturbing ones Subjective, of course. It's called The Long Man in the Murder Alley at Hof. And it is 
translated by, of course, Jürgen Hubert, who we'll see some commentary from later, <clears throat> in his collection Sunken Castles Evil Poodles, which is a Patreon that you can fund to support the translation of a bunch of works, or collected works of German folklore that have never been translated to English. Before this great dying, the plague in the town of Hof in 1519, people were said to witness a tall, black, long man in Morgasa, or in our tongue, Murder Alley. With his thighs spread apart wide, he stepped into the two sides of the alley and his head reached high above the houses. It was indeed my ancestress, Vyborg Veitman, who had to walk through the above mentioned alley one evening and witnessed herself how he had one foot at the yard entrance of the pub and the other on the other side at the large house. Full of fear, she did not know if she should go back or go forward. But then she gathered the courage to press on in God's name, made the sign of the cross in front of her, and thus went straight through the center of the alley, and therefore between the apparition's legs. For she had to complete her errand, whether that haunt followed her or not. She had barely passed through when the haunt smacked its legs together behind her with such force that a loud crackling sound arose. As if the houses in the entire Moragasa were collapsing. Soon after, the Great Plague followed, and the dying started in the Moragasa. There is no chore, no chore, nothing in my life that would force me to walk under an unusually tall man's legs in a place called Murder Alley. I would walk around the city. I would there, eventually you're going to get to fields where there aren't murder alleys and you're going to find another gate to where you're going. Under no circumstances am I walking under tall man's slender legs. What task could possibly motivate you to do that? Do you tell me in chat under what circumstances would you walk under the tall man's legs? <clears throat> All right. Now, the next one is one of my favorite stories, or at least premise for a story. But it is basically the ring with a twist. Uh, and not the ring like the Lord of the Rings. The ring like the horror movie. Um, but, uh, yeah, I got to pull it up. Give me a second. I am curious, though, if there are any chores that any of you would do. Witchery says, oh, hello, Witchery. Witchery is a regular of our uh, Thursday show. Welcome. Says there's an actual fireplace. Yes, sort of. It's a video of somebody who says you can use it. If you give credit for it, and that credit is in my description. I don't remember who they are. Shana Tower says, I'm with you about going around. <laughs> and Felix, hello, Felix. Felix has uh, featured on the channel before, a uh, writer friend of mine. Maybe if they paid me like $10, I'd walk under the legs. Buddy, you got to value your life more than that. These were plague thighs. <laughs> also, it's good to hear from you, Felix. I was thinking about you the other day. This next tale is called Spiritus Familiaris, and it also comes to us from Sunken Castle's Evil Poodles, translations by Jürgen Hubert, who 
you can fund on the Patreon, which will be pinned in the comment below. The Spiritus Familiaris. It is commonly stored in a small, well-sealed bottle. And it looks not quite like a spider, not quite like a scorpion. But it moves, skitters, taps at the glass incessantly. It will stay in the pockets of those who purchase it. No matter where they put the small bottle, wherever they want, it will always return to them on their own. It brings great fortune, makes hidden treasures visible, renders them beloved to their friends and feared by their enemies. In war, they will be strengthened like steel and iron so that its owners will always be victorious. It also guards against imprisonment. It is not necessary to bathe and dress it like the little gallowsmen. Sure, another thing. But whoever keeps it till they die must go to hell with it. <laughs> For this reason, the owner seeks to sell it again. But it can only be sold for a price lower than it was purchased until someone is left over who bought it with the lowest valued coin. A soldier who purchased it for a crown and then became familiar with this dangerous spirit threw it to the feet of the previous owner and hurried away. But when he had arrived at his home later that day, he once again found it in his pocket. He fared no better when he threw it into the Danube, which is a river for those who don't know. A horse trader and carter from Oxbach once entered a famous German city. The journey had been hard on his animals, and at the gate one horse dropped dead. The second one fell at the end, and within a few days the other six, yes, six horses had died as well. He despaired, walked around the city, bemoaned his dire straits to other people under tears. As it happened, though, he encountered another carter whom he told of his misfortune, and that one said, Do not worry, for I propose a means out of this for which you shall thank me. The horse trader dismissed this as empty words. No, no, comrade, you shall be helped. Go into that house and ask for a certain party, which I shall tell you about. Relate your misfortune and plead for help. Well, the horse trader, with little other options, followed the stranger's advice went into the house and asked a boy who was present after said party. He had to wait for a reply. And finally, the boy returned, opened a room for him. Inside, numerous old men sat around at a table. And they addressed him by name and said, Eight of your horses have fallen. This has troubled you. And now you've come to us to seek help on the advice of one of your comrades. You shall receive what you desire. The carter had to sit down at a side table, and after a few minutes, they handed him a small box with the words, Carry this with ya, and you shall become rich from this hour onwards. But beware, never open the box unless you want to become poor again. Well, the horse trader asked what he had to pay for this small box, but the men didn't want anything for it. He merely had to write his name 
into a big book, which he was guided. The horse trader went home, but as soon as he had stepped out of the house, he found a leather bag with 300 ducats, which is quite the currency of that time, <clears throat> which he used to buy new horses. Before he left the city, he found another large pot with old tallers, also a high value item, uh, a coin type, in the stables where the new horses stood. When he traveled elsewhere and put the small box on the ground, a penetrating light appeared where money had been lost or buried in old times, which allowed him to easily excavate it. And in this manner, he attained great treasures without thievery or murder. What a miracle. Now it was so that when the wife of the horse trader had heard of his experiences, she, in her wisdom, startled and spoke. You have received something evil. God does not want humans to get rich through such forbidden things, but has said that you shall eat your bread in the sweat of your face. I beg you for the sake of your soul, travel back to the city and deliver your box back to those people. Now the man was moved by these words and decided to send an assistant there to bring it back, but the assistant returned with it. And the news that these people, the eight men around the table, could no longer be found, and nobody knew where they might currently reside. After that, the woman took special care where her husband put that small box and noticed that he stored it in a custom pocket within his waistband. In one night she rose up, pulled it out, and opened it, and then a black, buzzing fly flew out of it, took a path through the open window. She closed the lid again, put the box back to its usual place, without worrying what would happen next, for the man had not told her the full text of his warning. And so from that hour onwards, all their previous fortune, the bags of gold that it revealed, turned into the most worrying misfortune. The horses dropped dead or were stolen. The grain in the attic rotted. The house burned down, not once, twice, but three times. And his gathered wealth in compensating for these tragedies evaporated over time. The man fell into debt. He became utterly destitute, completely poor, worse than before. And in his desperation, he first killed his wife with a knife and then shot a bullet through his own head. <clears throat> Suppose I should have said content warning on that one. My apologies. Uh, Witchery says, rough story for a horse girl. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> My apologies. Uh, all the horses didn't die. They um, became unicorns and ran away. Generis' curiosity didn't just kill the cat. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, GS says, these are seriously dark. They are seriously dark. I was holding on to some of the darkest stuff the closer to Halloween we got. Uh, there is still stuff darker than this that I... probably wouldn't read on the channel. Witchery says they flew away with Pegasus to a happy land without demon boxes. Yeah, where animals get punished for things their owners do. Um, the uh, the next one is less dark. Uh, but, I mean... Uh, the, le the next one is pretty much about a stalker, in, in a sense. So, you know, heads up if that's a triggering thing. And then after that, it's kind of silly ones were, were about... 
giant bunny monsters, so <laughs> it doesn't get darker. We, I think probably the murder-suicide is as dark as we get. <clears throat> Okay. Now for this one, is there something more internal? This one mostly isn't around a house. Okay. Not really. <laughs> I don't really have another option. Let's, uh, let's have a little bit of distant thought. Our next tale is called The Spirit Appears as the Wife. It also comes as a translation from Jürgen Hubert, who you can support in the pinned comment. Duke Johann Casimir had a stable master of noble lineage, and this man had the strange experience that a spirit frequently appeared to him in the form of his still living wife which disturbed him greatly. Just like the wife wore particular clothes, so did the spirit, and regularly appeared, not in the night, but during the noon hour, from eleven to twelve o'clock, when he might have expected to see his wife. For this reason, the wife never went anywhere without company, so that she could be distinguished from the vexing spirit. But at the meal table, the stable master still did know, didn't know at times which one of them was actually his wife. If a cleric was present, well, the spirit kept their distance. Once the confessor of the family, one Johann Brusha, had been invited, and when leaving the noble, accompanied him to the stairway together with his wife and his sister. And it was then that the spirit climbed up the stairs from below and grabbed the lady at her apron through a wooden grid. The lady screamed uh, loudly, whereupon the spirit vanished. Once the spirit lay with its arm on the threshold to the kitchen, and the cook asked, What do you want? Whereupon the spirit replied, <laughs> I want your mistress. But it did not harm her. The stable master's wife pressured him to leave their house, which was in the Spitalkasa, and move into the house later inhabited by Dr. Froman. And then the spirit became visible and audible and spoke, You can move. Wherever you want, I will follow you, even if it means to the ends of the earth. But the stable master still moved out of the house, and then the doors of the rear building were thrown shut with great force. The spirit was no longer seen in that abandoned building, but it was even more so in their new home. And then the stable master moved into another larger house in a suburb near the Rosenau Castle. Finally, it moved into Ehrenberg Palace, and as he had become Schlosshauptmann, which is like head guard, there the spirit finally ceased to make appearances. And that's folklore for you. Does it explain it? No. Is there any thematic reason why moving, as uh, Jürgen points out in his commentary, 250 meters away? No. <laughs> Who knows? <clears throat> Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know why that worked that time. All right. <clears throat> Witchery says, um, 
Uh, bunny? Oh no, it's noon here. Oh yeah, it's noon here. Can you, like, there is something, um, the reason why I really like this story is there's something so peculiar and unusual about a ghost, who is, or a spirit rather, not a ghost, who is upfront about the fact of who they are and is really just there to try and replace one of your loved ones and sometimes is so bold to just sit there at the same time. I have never heard a tale go that way. It's it's so unique. <clears throat> okay, so as a palate cleanser for the murder-suicide ones and all the dead horses, um, we are going to talk about some monsters, monster bunnies, where the bunnies win, which I think is who we're voting for. Uh, still kind of gruesome in places. Some are more silly. Um, some are helpful, though. We're going to see examples of that. Um... <clears throat> but, uh, yeah. Just gotta get to it. Whoops. Nope. Not what I hit. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, Witchery said maybe the ghost needed them to move away from their favorite sitting spot. Maybe it just it just got bored. <laughs> I mean, how long can you really do ghost stuff, right? Without getting bored. <clears throat> okay, we're going to read two stories. There are three tales I could read in Jurgen's collection about cryptid hairs. Hairs? Hairs. Don't know why I added a vowel in there um but uh the um <clears throat> i'm only gonna read two of them because one of them is very short and doesn't really um change much uh shana tower says i keep picturing the easter bunny heads looming above me on shelving while i worked part-time at a costume shop some of them were really creepy oh god well for what it's worth, these don't sound like cute ones. Like, Harris have the longer nose and the ears and stuff. They're a little more wild looking. I don't know if that helps. It's not quite Five Nights of Freddy's that that would be. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Our next tale is just called Hares, as in the bunnies. And it is also a translation by Jurgen Hubert, who you can support at the Patreon in the pinned comment below. And it is about a strange and uncanny bunny. In earlier times, masses were held on Fridays during Lent in the chapel at Schutz, in the Dawn District. Many people from the surrounding cu communities used to attend them, once a man from G, um, apparently it doesn't give you the name, traveled there with the same intention. However, since he was a huntsman, he took his rifle with him in order to beg some game on the way. After hiking for a while, the huntsman finally saw a hare there in the forest, bordering the chapel. However, this hare led him back and forth on a chair until, chase rather, until mass had already started. But when the bells rang <clears throat> for the start of the Eucharist, the hare finally permitted the huntsman to come so close that the latter aimed and shot but the rifle burst and tore off the man's arm and the tear jumped away under roaring laughter. In a similar vein, once a man who was obsessed with the hunt went hunting on a Sunday during mass. <gasps> the horrors. 
and it was then that he encountered a hare. And he aimed at it, but the rifle, it failed to shoot. And soon after, the same hare returned, and the same thing happened. And the same hare appeared in the sights of the huntsman for a third time. And when he aimed at it, the hare did a very strange thing indeed. It got bigger and bigger and bigger till it was of monstrous proportion. And it was then that the huntsman began to sweat, and he did not dare shoot for at that size. It would merely anger this terrible buck-toothed beast. And from that time onwards, he no longer roamed on Sundays and holy days, and went to the church instead of going hunting. Shana Towers gets it. That's what you get for hunting meat on a Friday during Lent. Correct. These are about hares that punish you. This is not an uncommon thing, by the way. Um, actually, the hunt thing... I mean, I guess hunting must have been quite the past. I mean, it still is, but especially then when it was outright necessary. Because my all-time favorite character in German folklore... Uh, anybody who's a regular viewer already knows what I'm going to say, is Frau Gauden, who is the mother of the Wild Hunt. And I believe it's northern German cities or something. If you watch my Wild Hunt video, almost a year old, in my, um, <clears throat> which was done around Christmas because of last year, because it is a, a Christmas thing, if you didn't know. Um, it's an account of the Wild Hunt where a woman says that she would rather continue hunting than go to heaven and her and her 30 daughters are cursed to be to hunt forever although it's not clear that she dislikes that um, but her 30 daughters get changed into hunting hounds and she rides around on a cloud <clears throat> uh, and occasionally gets people she's kind of uh the point i make in that video is that the wild hunt is is very obviously serves as inspiration for a lot of modern accounts of santa isn't what you might expect the wild hunt as a as an event roots most likely back to sort of thor leaving leading the valkyries around the 12 days of christmas but it changes <clears throat> okay one more one more story of a bunny and then i'm going to talk to you about next week Our last story of the evening is called The Three-Legged Hare, and it is, again, a cryptid, but one that's a bit more helpful than the rest. It also comes to us as a translation from Jürgen Hubert, who you can support in the pinned comment below. There are a few accounts of this. I'll read them in sequence. When an army was once stationed in Luxembourg, one soldier had fallen asleep on his guard duty. He was found sleeping and condemned to running the gauntlet, which I'm going to give you the footnote on, a form of corporal punishment where the victim has to run between two rows of soldiers who will hit them with sticks or other weapons. The punishment was executed, and he was beaten up so badly that he died soon after. A corporal who had conducted himself in a particularly inhumane manner during this later received his just wages and died an ignominious death. But the soldier was turned into a three-legged hare after his demise, and in this form he wanders without rest at night from one guard post to the next. And if he encounters a soldier who has fallen asleep on his post, he will hit them with his paw so that the soldier wakes up. And in this manner, he protects the soldiers from the cruel punishment which he has suffered from himself. Story 2 Once the cow herd of Fogelbeck drove his cow to a spot close to Fogelsberg. Even though he was not allowed to let them graze there, but since he'd done so several times before without being caught by the forester, he had become brazen and the thought that 
he could dare to do so again. He sat down on the ground when suddenly a three-legged hare approached and it sat down before him and raised its front paws into the air as if it wanted to hit him. Seeing this, the herder set his dog upon the hare. Go, boy! Kill! But the dog knew better. It remained quiet. It did not move. Even though it otherwise always loved to hunt hares and had caught one several times, even just the day prior. Well, now the herder himself jumped up and drove the hare away with a stick. But a short time later, the forester appeared and caught the herder at the forbidden spot, setting stuff to graze. And it was then that the herder understood that the three-legged hare had wanted to warn him that the forester was approaching. Account number three. In old times, there used to be a village named Honzin. <clears throat> This village went under. Now, the German verb untergehen, going under, has connotations of both literal sinking and more metaphorical ceasing to exist in the same sense that a company goes under. However, the latter applied to the real world, Hansen. The story implies the former. Now, just before I move on here, uh, it's a big thing in German folklore that castles and cities and stuff sink into the ground. They don't really. It's sort of just soil washes over over time and stuff crumbles. And so what happens is when you're a farmer, you dig stuff up. But you can see how people come to the impression that that stuff sank. <clears throat> but the region where it used to stand is still called Honzen. And many people have their vegetable gardens there. When everything is quiet on Sunday mornings, the pig herder still often hears those church bells ringing. Deep in the earth below his feet. He also swears that he once heard the organ when he put his head, his rather ear to the ground. Be that as it may, it is true that it is uncanny in Honzen, and everyone who has a lot of land there can see the tracks of the three-legged one the next morning. Some claim that the three-legged one is a three-legged donkey who roams in Honzen between twelve and one o'clock and then travels into the city to the small alley at the St. Anna Church in Pogenhagen. But the three-legged creature is no donkey, but rather a three-legged hare. Anyone can convince themselves of this by closely examining the tracks, but may God beware us from seeing the hare itself. For everyone who has encountered the three-legged one suffered for it. Thus people stay away from Honzen at night if they have no business there. I don't know like what the suffering is i'm not sure why it doesn't tell you that but uh that's classic folklore for you what's the most interesting part of this we're not going to tell you that part it'll tell you the names of 10 people that don't matter to the story but it won't tell you what the the rabbit does <clears throat> okay um right I was going to mention, uh, because I'm going to go on to translator's notes, but before I do that, uh, this year, Fireside Fairy Tales lands exactly on Halloween. Um, and I've been wondering about what I want to do with that, because there's a mixed bag. On the one hand, you say, well, Halloween, obviously, that this is made for Halloween. Uh, that'll be great. But the truth is, a lot of people are probably already doing stuff on Halloween night. Um, so it's likely a quiet night. Um, I also had to ask myself, what is it that I would want to do on a Halloween night. Uh, um, so I, um, I, I sort of dug through my mind on that and I came to a conclusion of what can only be described as a bad idea if you know anything about YouTube. But 
whatever. Um, I want to read a longer form story from probably my favorite horror author who have already read this month, so I'm cheating, <laughs> called Sheridan Lafan, who uh, it's a story of a vampire, a uh, lesbian vampire, which is a trope in and of itself. But this story called Carmilla predates Bram Stoker's vampire tale, Dracula, by 25 years. Um, it is... Uh, well known among people who like this sort of stuff, uh, but not that widely known beyond that, which is strange because in many ways it establishes a lot of standards of, of vampire tales, gothic vampire tales. <clears throat> um, the um, Carmilla is around 100 pages long, which means that it's probably around three and a half to four hours for me to read. And we'll see how I do. Right. Um, I used to read, I used to speak for eight hours a day, four to five days a week as a part of my job, but obviously I'm not doing that so much anymore. So we'll see how I go. Um, the thing is, though, you make a three to four hour video, almost no one's going to watch it. So if it is interesting to you, I, I, you know, I would love for you to come along and join me on Halloween night by the fireside. It is an atmospheric tale. It's not a particularly gruesome tale, if that's what you're looking out for. Um, it is one of building menace and it's very well done in that regard. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, that's, that's my sale to my hardcore audience, but if you are just in for the shorter little peculiar short tales of folklore, I did actually make my Halloween playlist. Uh, it's on the challenge channel now of all the the month of October streams I've done. Witchery says uh, they love Carmilla. Uh, yeah, I, I I really enjoy Carmilla. I think it'll be a, a hard sell to a YouTube audience, but all gothic everything is a hard sell to a YouTube audience. Who knows? Um, so if you want to join me on Halloween night, if you have little else to do, as, as I will, um, join me for the longest Fireside Fairy Tales I'll ever do. Even if you can only do part of it and you watch the rest later, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> for a genuinely uh, engaging and interesting um, uh, and relatively famous, although increasingly lesser known, vampire tale of romance and in a twisted sense and gothic atmosphere. <clears throat> Witchery says, there was a biggest Carmilla adaption on YouTube. Like, like they've acted it out? Eh, yeah. Genera says, not to this goth girl. Ah, that's perfect. See, I know, I, I know my people. <laughs> we found each other. <laughs> kind of people that would, that like that gothic atmosphere. Why, why I'm emphasizing the atmosphere, by the way, is because, like, in horror stories and in horror movies of modern times, you don't see this as much, but the thing about gothic horror it's not that anything particularly horrifying usually happens. There might be a scene or a sentence or two, but, you know, it, it, it comes and it goes. But it sticks with you because it's such a low build and it usually has relevance to some part of your life. They're almost always about toxic relationships. Um... <clears throat> uh, Witchery says, yeah, they also made a movie. I'm curious how it would work as a movie. Because, you know, there isn't a lot of visual events in it. It's a lot of feeling. Shana Tower says, if I wasn't spending the evening scaring children. Yeah, <laughs> it's not for children. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it for children. Uh, it's not particularly body or anything like that, but it's definitely, it's got erotic undertones and gruesome stuff. And yeah, it's not for kids. Uh, but anyways, that's what I'm going to be doing on Halloween night. So phone your family and don't, no, I'm kidding. Just show up. If I have like five people hanging out, that's great. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, but let's go on to uh, look at our translator's notes from the same fellow who translated the stuff tonight. But uh, some notes he gave us on, um, on the chest crusting, crushing stories we wrote. Wrote. <clears throat> Uh, so, right now you're seeing a screen that says Translator's Notes. You will not see my face because I do not want people to think that these words are my own. I don't want to take credit for someone else's words. <clears throat> um, 
But these words come from Jürgen Hubert. They were a comment uh, in reply to the chess crushing video I did uh, earlier in the month, or I think actually in September, uh, which were translations that he did. So he gives us some commentary, some uh, context on some of the things and responds to questions that people had in the chat and so on about those stories, because I am not an expert on this stuff. <clears throat> so, Jürgen's words. I'm a bit late, but here are some notes. All these tales, all the chest crushing tales, are from a folklore collection by one Ludwig Strakogen, who lived in Oldenburg. Uh, the same town in northwestern Germany I live myself. Again, that's Jürgen's words. I visited quite a few of the towns mentioned in the tales. So far, no Valride attacks. As it happens, one tale from southern Germany claims that such night hags called trudes in that area often end up as witches if they are not cured of their condition. Women whose mothers use magic to ease the pain of childbirth are especially susceptible to this fate. Jürgen is responding to a comment in this next one that I made in the stream. No one is a master of folklore. I'm just a guy who has read a lot of folk tales without any formal training. Being a dabbler in this field is a long and proud tradition. Uh, that is accurate. <laughs> Though I will say, let me remove this for a minute. Um, what I meant was I didn't have like a master's in literature about folklore, like, like, don't necessarily always trust what I was saying, but fair enough, that is true. A lot of folklore is done by amateurs like me. <clears throat> um, from what I gather, the concept of a spirit with its own agenda ties into the old Norse concept of hammer, with the part of one's soul that was capable of shape-shifting. I haven't investigated this in depth, but you might want to look out for texts explaining this in more detail. Night hag spirits are most commonly women, but on occasion they are also men, and in one case an actual horse who tormented the postal rider who rode it during the day. That sounds like a great story. It is almost universal in German folklore that if someone uses magical flight, they will hit a church tower on the way. And you know what? You're right, Jürgen. I can think of like five stories that happens in. Um... <clears throat> Pressing or squeezing others is often portrayed as a strong compulsion, which can only maybe be mitigated by squeezing animals instead of people. So my translation of the Druids, for example, which I'm not sure if I've read on the stream, I don't think so. Back in those days, job protection was far worse than they are today, especially in Germany, so firing someone for being a Valraida was presumably easy to do. One of the most noteworthy differences between British and German folklore is that the British spirits will give you gold that will turn into crap in the morning. Well, in German folklore, it's the other way around. That's true. Uh, that's something Frau Gauden does. Gives you crap, and then in the morning, it turns to gold. Um, <clears throat> in the 19th century, spending time in the Dutch lowlands as a seasonal migrant wor worker was very common among poor peasant laborers in northwestern Germany. These migrant workers were treated about as well as migrant workers today. Some things never change, but as usual, the lack of better options made this attractive nonetheless. Inviting such a spirit who visits you to come back the next day seems to be a fairly common way of identifying them. Again, see the Druids, for example, from the other end of Germany. <clears throat> um, now, some of those aren't going to make a ton of sense if you didn't watch the original video. Uh, video, but um, I I would say one of the most interesting things is that inversion where, because you see this in folklore where like the same ideal will come up, but in reverse. Um, and actually the, the uh, we talked about a version of that, I think it was last week. We're talking about babies that were born with calls, which is a thin membrane over their head. Um, and that in German folklore, it could mean you were a wicked and evil thing. Um, or unless certain steps were taken. But in Italian folklore, um, it m could mean that you were a very good thing, that a good spirit that did good things. Um, <clears throat> so, different takes, right? Notable events with different takes. Uh, so that's our translator's notes. Uh, as I said, next week will be our, our, our end of... Oh, I left the rain on. 
uh, which is accurate, actually, by the way. It is utterly pouring cold rain here right now. Um, I know that I get viewers from all around the world who are probably having a better time of it, but this is Vancouver. We are a rainforest, and it's showing its colors. Um, <clears throat> or its lack of colors therein. It's quite gray and miserable outside. But, um, yeah, um... If you folks have the time on Halloween, which I understand is a busy time for most people, feel free to come along and, and uh, we'll read Carmilla together. Which is, uh, I will say this though, if you do plan to read Carmilla, I think it is even more interesting if you go back and you watch, and this is actually why I chose to do it this year, uh, my video on vampires that I think I did last week. Um, <clears throat> because... One of the things that's so interesting to me about Carmilla is it sort of stands somewhere between, I'll probably repeat myself on Tuesday next week, it stands between Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is largely influenced by a lot of Eastern lore, and some literary made-up stuff. I mean, it's all made up, but like literary stuff, obviously influenced by people like Sheridan Lafan. Um, but it's also connecting itself to folklore collections that we see. And some of it in there, this is why I think it's worth watching it before you watch the Camarilla one, some of it in there, some of the tropes and stuff that we discussed in that vampire uh, episode, you'll see come up in Carmilla that don't generally make it all the way out to Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, um, and therefore, which had a much greater influence, you don't see it as much in modern vampire media. But you will see it where it's coming from if you go and you watch the video I did. Um, so, uh, with that said, you have learned that I'm not a great salesman. <laughs> That's what you've learned. I could have said that in a much quicker way. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Shayna Towers, Witchery, Genera, and GS for coming and joining me by the fireside for these old folklore and fairy tales. Um, next week it'll be Carmilla, which is not really folklore, but folklore inspired. But after that, we'll be getting into the winter season. Uh, which is a favorite of mine um, <clears throat> and winter indeed not just Christmas because actually Christmas doesn't really provide you with a lot of lore you would think it would there's stuff that happens around Christmas but there isn't actually a lot of Christmas lore there is some stuff about winter and we'll see what we can find uh, to bring in that season <clears throat> so with all of that said thank you so much for coming by I'll keep the fire warm for you and uh, maybe just ignore the person tapping on your window.